Good morning. So I'm really excited to be here. I do a lot of speaking around the country, but it's always my favorite to come to schools because I love talking with young people, being with young people and sharing my story. Um, so thank you guys for coming out. Uh, I wanna talk to you today about my journey through the criminal justice system. So I know you're all studying criminal justice and you read a lot about it in books. You probably heard your teacher speak a lot about it, but it hits a little different when you actually understand what it's like to actually go through it. And I would rather me tell you my own experience so you can understand rather than you have to go through it as I did. So this is my journey through the criminal justice system. I grew up, started out life, much like many of you guys. I grew up in Clarksville, right outside of Fort Campbell, which is a military base. Uh, my father was retired military. My mother's a school teacher. She teaches special needs for high school to this day. I had a pretty normal childhood. I can't think of anything that was really off or dysfunctional in my home. If you would look at the precursors to criminal justice involvement, you would have never looked twice in my direction. I never went to bed hungry. I wasn't abused at home or anything like that. I had a pretty normal, happy, healthy childhood. But I ended up here. And so how did I get to this point? So I grew up, obviously, as a mixed race child in a black family. This was a time when there weren't many other kids who looked like me. So from the very first day that I started kindergarten, I was aware that I was different. It was about maybe 10 minutes into us getting into the class. Our parents brought us in. My parents were up in the front meeting my teacher, and I sat down and started to meet my classmates. And very quickly, the conversation turned to was I black or was I white, because they were confused. And I never gave it much thought. So they pointed out that I didn't look like my parents, which is something else that had never come to mind. My family never made me feel any different from them or that somehow I didn't match. So it was never something that I had considered. But in that moment, looking up at the front of the classroom, I felt different. I felt odd. And I had all of these questions. And so when my mom came to pick me up from school later that day, I wasted no time asking her those same questions. And one answer led to another question, and each answer just left me feeling even more confused. I was mixed, she explained to me, both black and white. And her and my father had adopted me from a white woman who couldn't take care of me. She tried to reassure me that I was beautiful and that I was loved just the way that I was, but this seed of doubt took root in my spirit and I couldn't help but see life through a different lens after that moment. Now I just saw how different I was from everyone. My family, my friends, my church family, everywhere I looked and every situation I would find myself in, I'd automatically distinguish myself from the people around me. For a while, you know, I just kind of withdrew to myself. Um, I didn't want to make friends at school definitely didn't want to be the teacher's pet, and didn't want to have group assignments, didn't want to work in groups, and whenever I refused to do that, the teacher labeled me as having a bad attitude. No one ever really asked me what it was that I was going through, what I was struggling with, so I was constantly just pushed to the side. So I was sent to the principal's office on a regular basis um, for little things such as rolling my eyes or calling out answers, and every time I got sent to the principal's office, I would be sent to ISS in school suspension. I don't know if they still have that. Hopefully not. But after so many trips to ISS, I found myself getting suspended. And it came to a point where I spent more time being suspended or in ISS than I did in the classroom. And I actually went through some of my uh, write-ups when I got all of my records after I was released. And you would expect to find some pretty serious infractions, but they were all minor things. I think the most serious thing was when I shook a stop sign at a bus stop, and that warranted a five-day suspension from school and the bus. Um, so it just seemed to me that they were constantly trying to push me to the side because it was easier for them to hide me or to get rid of me than to actually deal with whatever it was I was struggling with. And I felt that as a kid. The straw that broke the camel's back was when I brought a bottle of no-dose pills for show and tell. Do y'all know what no-dose pills are? Okay, so no dose pills, I don't know if they still have them, but back in the day they were these caffeine pills. And so truck drivers would take them to stay up. 
Um, just people would just take them. It was just, you can go into Walmart and buy it off the shelf. But the school saw it as a drug. And I was expelled from public school under the zero tolerance policy for having those pills for show and tell. What that meant was that my mother had to take me down to the city bus depot so that the woman could teach me as a 12 year old how to navigate the city bus system by myself just so I can go across town to get some form of an education at the alternative school. Hopefully none of you have ever gone to alternative school. Hopefully you're not familiar with that. Um, but it's not really a school. What it is is a warehouse for kids that nobody really wants to deal with. So I was the youngest kid there at the alternative school. And most of the other kids there were on probation of some form. They, some of them were actually in custody and would leave the facility to come to school there. And there was no one teaching classes. You literally went into the classroom, sat at your desk, they gave you a stack of papers, which was a syllabus, and you had to work through that and put it in a basket. You couldn't talk. You had to wear white t-shirts, jeans, tucked in, facing away from the teacher the entire day. Basically, you sat in time out. It was like living every single day in ISS. Um, so naturally, nobody wants to sit in time out for six to eight hours a day. I certainly didn't. Many of the other kids at the school didn't. So we started skipping school. We felt like it didn't matter if we were there or not because we weren't learning anything. And so one day when I skipped school, me and three of the older kids ended up catching charges. So less than six months from the time that I entered alternative school, I ended up before the juvenile court judge in Montgomery County and was sent to a facility. So at this facility, it was in Nashville. They called it a assessment facility aka a mental hospital, where they see if you have any conditions that would keep you from being put in custody, which I'll get into that here in a second. But 30 days inside of this facility where I couldn't call my mom without the permission from some random staff member under some kind of obscure system that they had devised for approvals. I couldn't even move from one room to another room without being supervised from some random staff member. So this was completely oppressive. It was something I had never experienced. And beyond that, I was a 12 year old kid and I had never been away from my parents that long. So to have to be here in this place and fall asleep with a bunch of strangers, it was unsettling. And I started to see why most of the kids that I had gone to alternative school with were completely different. They seemed to walk around with what many people would say is a chip on their shoulder because I was never the same after I came out of that facility either. I came out of there, I was sent back to public school because that former school year where I was expelled had expired. But now that I was sent back to public school, I was more of an outcast than ever before. They placed me in the special needs class, even though I was not special ed, but they put me there because it was seated back off behind another classroom and those kids never came out of that class except for lunch. I didn't even know the entire time that I went to this high school that that room existed, that that class existed. We were hidden that well. And even within that classroom, they hid me even more. They placed me in the back of the classroom behind the teacher's desk and installed a partition specifically for me, like they had an ISS, just so the teacher could sit me away from her other students. So once again, I was spending the day in time out. I ended up bringing to school one day something called crochet yarn. Do y'all know what crochet is? You're probably too young for that. Okay, you do. So I learned to crochet at the facility where I was at, and so it was kind of like a coping thing. And for me, I didn't want to go back to the facility, didn't want to get in trouble again, just wanted to basically do my time there in the school day and go home. And so I would sit there and I would just crochet all day because once again, what else am I there for? They're not teaching me anything. They're just hiding me. And one day I went to lunch and I came back into the classroom and I realized that I had left my purse. And I needed my purse, obviously, because I need to get you know, some nerds out of the vending machine. I don't know if they have vending machines anymore. I think that there was this whole healthy movement. But I went back to the classroom and when I walked in, I saw the teacher going through my purse. And immediately, like, 
I did the first thing that came to my mind. I snatched my purse out of her hand and was like, what are you doing? Well, that's considered assault. At least for me it was. So this time they found another excuse to get rid of me. And instead of sending me back to alternative school, they bypassed that altogether and went to the court to have my probation violated. And that's where things took a turn, right? So I went back, had my probation violated. This time I was sent to a series of facilities they call residential treatment centers that actually offer very little in terms of treatment. So you have these group homes, these youth homes. I was at one called Omni Center or Omni Visions. Omni Visions now, they don't necessarily run that home. They run some other homes, but they do a lot of the foster care for DCS here in Tennessee. But this time they had a facility back then. And I was there with all these kids who was dealing with trauma, much like I was. And there was nobody really there to help us navigate it, right? We all go through stuff, but hopefully we all have someone who's healthy in our lives, helping us to figure that out, helping us to learn how to regulate our emotions, to express our emotions in a healthy way. There was none of that. We didn't have any kind of, of meaningful therapy classes or any of that. Basically, all they did was shove pills down our throat. So you had a bunch of kids who didn't know how to navigate their trauma, so we took it out on each other. Every single day, we were fighting. I may not look at it now, but every single day, we were going to war. Um, and you get tired of that. I certainly did. I got tired of fighting every single day for basic human rights, for respect, for dignity, and for my life, pretty much because we were beating the crap out of each other over things like who sat in what chair and who was first in the medication line. So I ended up doing like most kids do in DCS who were housed in state facilities and I ran away. And that's where things took a turn for the worst. The three years that followed that decision when I was 13 were hands down, hands down, the most chaotic, traumatic and reckless times in my life. In that time, I would be raped on numerous occasions. I would be assaulted, threatened, and sold by a man that I thought I loved. And at the close of what was certainly one of the darkest chapters of my life, a man would die at my hands. Every single day that I was on the run, there was this high drama event that would play out and everything that my mother had ever taught me about life was turned on his head. I ended up living with a group of adults, these women who were mid to early 20s, and they didn't treat me like a 13 year old. They had no problem allowing me to do and learn things that no 13 year old girl ever should. They taught me that in order to survive, like I would need to, the best way to do that was to get money from men. Conversation ruled the nation was the phrase that was always thrown around in that house. It taught me that God had given me a money-making commodity with my body and that I could either sit on it, I could play with it, I could give it away for free, or I could do the smart thing and get paid for it. That's what they taught me as a 13-year-old. And that is how I was primed to being trafficked, which I'll get to in a second. But the men that I met with them were all much older than me. There was no point in being with someone who was around my age or under the age of 18 because they likely wouldn't have the means to give me what I needed to survive, to give me the money that I needed to put clothes on my back, to put food in my mouth, to keep a roof over my head because I had to give those girls money to stay there. And all of these men, they weren't necessarily what you would think in your mind as predators. Some of these men, were family men, they were people's husbands, they were teachers, they were pastors, praying on me as a child. And I thought I was in a relationship with them. So by the time I ended up meeting the man that trafficked me, everything was already put into place where I thought it was normal. I had this worldview where this toxic relationship structure was normal for me. So when he proposed that I go out and I get money, to benefit our relationship, to bring something to the table, I didn't view it as trafficking. 
if anybody in this room would have told me that he was my pimp, I would have told you you were crazy because I considered it as us hustling together. And that's what most young people who get caught up in this situation think of trafficking. You think that you have a sugar daddy. You think that you can go on OnlyFans and that's normal, that's accepted. It's not. Your body isn't a commodity. And I know we have a lot of young men here in the room. Don't think you're exempt from that. You're not exempt from being exploited either because I've seen it happen time and time again. A lot of the kids that I work with, it happens. For you guys, mostly it looks like gangs. It looks like drug dealers in your neighborhood exploiting you, convincing you that it's okay for you to do this because you're not gonna do that much time. Before I was actually trafficked on the streets, there was a drug dealer who was in a relationship with one of the girls I was living with. And when he went to jail, he convinced me that I should help him out and sell his dope during the day. So I was 14, 15 years old selling crack in the projects and not really benefiting from it, just being exploited. That man actually, whenever he got out of jail, said he was going to Florida to pick up a shipment and wanted me to go with him. Because if we got caught, I wouldn't do that much time. I would just go to detention. Maybe some of you have been told that. So I went with him thinking, well, I'll just make this quick $5,000 just to go be with him while he picks up this dope. Went to a hotel for him to get his bags before we caught the bus and he drugged me and I spent the next three days with him being raped. But that was a little, um, a little caveat. Anyway, so here I am um, as a child, all that happens and this is where we end up back and forth being locked up while I was on the run. So this picture down here, this is how I started out. This is the very first time that I ran from that facility and I was 12, no, I was 13 in that picture. So if you just see the progression, this is when I was living with those women and started being trafficked. And this is where I was when I was 16 years old, when I was finally picked up. So this is all in the space of three years. So being with this man, I was maybe with him for about a month. We were living in hotels. Um, I was going out meeting men, doing what I had to do and coming back to him. Each time I thought that, you know, this time he's gonna be so happy with what I'm bringing to the table, we're just gonna live happily ever after. Nobody who's caught up in a trafficking situation thinks that that's gonna be their reality forever. My thought was that he was gonna take what I was bringing back, he was gonna flip it, we were gonna move somewhere, and I was gonna be his main, and we were gonna be happily ever after. Obviously, that's not what happened. On August 7th, 2004, he sent me out from my hotel room for the very last time. After once again walking into a situation where I was in way over my head, this time as a 16-year-old, I met a 43-year-old man. We went back to his house and I shot and killed him when I thought he was going to do something to me. Within 24 hours, I was arrested there at the hotel. The cops burst into the room. I was half naked because I wasn't allowed to wear clothes in the room when I was there with my trafficker. And I had to lay out on the concrete. And the very first thing that came to my mind when they burst in with that shotgun pointed at us is to say cut had nothing to do with it. I'll tell you everything. I never gave it thought to protecting my own interest or to how protecting cut would negatively impact me because my entire existence had revolved around making sure that cut was taken care of making sure that he was okay. He had preyed on the fact that my identity had just seemed to revolve around the need to be accepted. That went way back to when I was back in kindergarten. That need to feel like I belonged. And he exploited that. And so now, in my mind, I just lived to make sure he was fine because he was all I had. I considered him to be the only person that was giving me the love and attention, affection, that I had always wanted but never felt worthy to receive. And so I told them, I'll tell you everything, just let Cut go. They were fine with that. When we went to the police station, they sat me in a room that was lined with cubicles at a table. And there were no cameras in this room, which is important to remember. But they started talking to me and saying that, you know, we're gonna go in here, we're gonna take your confession, 
And you need to understand that you need to be completely open with us because whether or not you talk to us will be the difference between you serving nine years in prison and 99 years in prison. So needless to say, they made the right choice seem obvious, right? They didn't bother to explain to me that every single thing I said would be used against me in the worst possible way. They would misconstrue anything I said in order to benefit their version of events. And they didn't dare to explain to me the importance of having an attorney be present. So we went into the second smaller room, signing away my rights, waving my Miranda rights, just seemed like a formality. And so here I have a video that can show you just a little bit about that, and I'll talk about why there was an issue. Okay. All right, you, I want to get right before we get started, okay? So, so you have the right to remain silent. Do you understand that right? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. Okay. With that right in mind, do you wish to weigh that right and ask the questions now? Mm -hmm. Say yes or no? Yeah. <coughs> What's your word, Miss Hunter? No, I mean, I, I just, you want to just not be here, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, before we continue, there are additional rights that you must understand. Anything you say can be used against you in court. You have a right to a lawyer for advice before we ask you any question and have the lawyer with you during the question. If you cannot afford a lawyer, we will be provided to you free of charge before any question if you wish. Now I'm going to read your waiver of rights and ask you to sign it after I read your waiver of rights. You have, you have, this is, I have read the statement of my right, I had the right to read to me, then I understand what my rights are. I am willing to make a statement and answer questions, and answer questions. I do not want a lawyer at this time. I understand and know what I am doing. No promises or threats have been made to me, and no pressure or coercion of any kind has been used against me. I also, I mean, I'm just saying I'm not, you know, you're not, uh, we're not uh, promising you anything as far as like, you know, um, uh, 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 as far as you know, if I talk, yeah. you're listening and I promise me the same thing as far as I talk, but you just promise me that. Right. And that's saying that no, no one right. has promised me that you have. Well, I'm sure we, go, we, we will do everything we can to help you, if we can, you know. Whatever we can do to help you, we will. So, have y'all learned about confessions and Miranda rights yet? So who can tell me what was the problem in this video? Nobody can tell me? He didn't ask me if I understood my rights. He did say, do you understand these rights? Have they been read to you later? But there's something else that was really important, and it's important for all of you to learn no matter if you're gonna be an attorney at some point, if you're gonna go on to be in law enforcement, or unfortunately, if you're ever in a situation where you're being questioned. And that is, he said that he didn't make any promises of leniency, but he did, right? They're not allowed to do that. Cops can lie to you. They're legally allowed to lie to you in order to get a confession. That's not considered coercion. They're allowed to lie to you, but they're not allowed to promise you that you'll get a time cut or you'll get less time. What he did was he tried to say, oh, I can talk to the DA and try to be general about it, but they're not allowed to do that. Another thing he referenced is his partner here, Detective Baltimore referenced a conversation in another room. That's something else they're not allowed to do. You should know that as well. From the moment that you are arrested, and they read your rights, they're not supposed to have any conversations with you until you sign that waiver, until you get in that room where you sign the waiver saying that you waive your right 
to have an attorney present and that you're gonna talk with them and where it's recorded. There weren't supposed to be any conversations in the room away from the camera. And so while my attorneys later on down the line actually filed a motion called a suppression motion, do y'all know what that is? Okay, so they filed a motion to suppress this on those grounds, not only grounds that they made those promises, but the fact that I was a child at the time and I didn't have an adult present. If you're under the age, you need to have an adult present. They're supposed to make sure of that. The only problem with me is I told them that I was 19 in order to protect Cut so he didn't get arrested for being in the room with a naked minor. So those are a few things that you need to know about confessions with cops. And above all, you need to know if they're ever coming to you to ask you a question, please make sure you have a parent or attorney with you while you're in that situation. That's very important for you to know, okay? So moving on, so that's what happened with that. Um, even though they said, again, because they're allowed to lie, even though they said that they would talk to the DA for me to try to help me, they didn't. They actually charged me with the highest charges they could. So at this time, because I was a juvenile and before it went to the grand jury, it was criminal homicide. Um, criminal homicide is what they charge you with before they ever go to the grand jury to determine if it's first degree, second degree, manslaughter, or reckless homicide. So I was charged with criminal homicide and especially aggravated robbery. There's three forms of robbery. You have your basic robbery, you have aggravated robbery, and you have especially aggravated robbery where grievous bodily harm is caused to someone. So I was sent to the detention center for juveniles to await a transfer hearing. In the state of Tennessee, kids who are charged with certain charges, as long as you're 15, I think they lowered it to 14 for some crimes, but if you're charged with certain offenses, then you can face time as an adult. You can go through the adult system. Davidson County has done a great job at trying to pull back the reins on who all is transferred since Sheila Calloway has taken over as judge. But when I went through that system, it was Judge Betty Adams Green, and she was not as willing to be lenient. So beyond homicide with robbery charges, um, carjackings, I know many kids who are being transferred for that as an, to be tried as an adult. And so I had to go to a transfer hearing where the DA had moved to try me as an adult and he was seeking to show specific things to say that I was amenable to being transferred. Wait, where's my? Oh, so here we go. So whenever you have a transfer hearing, this is a statute that governs them. Do you guys know what statute is? Have you studied statute? So this is TCA 371134. So that's the statute that governs the transfer hearings. And so these are the grounds that they're supposed to be considering. And so it's normally a bifurcated proceeding. Do you know what that is? I'm gonna tell you anyway. So bifurcated proceeding means there's two parts to this proceeding. So the first part is under subset A. So they're trying to figure out if there is reasonable grounds to believe, probable cause, no, it's probable cause, not reasonable grounds. It's probable cause to believe that the child committed the delinquent act as alleged. That's fine, that's similar to what you go through in the adult system when you have a probable cause hearing, when you have like a detention hearing, a preliminary hearing. So that's the first part of that. We waived that in my case. Um, so we waived probable cause. We said there was enough evidence to say that there, it was likely that I committed this because I did con confess. But the second part is under subsections B and C, and that was the hearing that I had. And so at this hearing, they're trying to figure, well, how serious was it? And is there some kind of mental situation that they can be committed to an institution? So I was sent for an evaluation again, much like when I was 13, and sent to that evaluation center for 30 days. And when they determined that there was nothing that could have put me into a facility as being mentally insane, um, they figured out, well, do I need to be locked away? the interest of the community, do, is, is it required that I be locked away? So that's what the transfer hearing is. And in making that decision, these are the things that they're considering. So first and foremost, the extent and nature of the child's prior delinquency records. That did not weigh in my favor. So what the judge is doing here is they're looking at, have you been in and out of the system or is this just just a one-time thing. Is this your first time getting in trouble? Or do you have other things? Do you have truancy on your record? Do you have shoplifting? Do you have other things that have gone on? Is this a repeat kind of thing? So that's going to weigh against me in my case. 
The second thing is the nature of the past treatment efforts and the nature of the child's response. Again, that was not helpful for me. I had been in DCS custody. I ran from DCS custody. I was there for 18 months at different facilities. I started out at a level two facility. I was disrupted, sent to a level three facility, disrupted and sent to Woodland Hills, back when Woodland Hills had girls. Um, so that was not helpful. Ended up running away, never completed my aftercare successfully. So basically, in her mind, she said, I'm not going to send her back to a system that failed to rehabilitate her in the first place. Number three, whether the offense was against person or property, obviously, if you did something against another person, whether than stealing a car or something like that, that's going to weigh more heavily. So four, whether it was committed in an aggressive and premeditated manner. And this is where it gets sticky because when you have preliminary hearings, something called jeopardy is not supposed to attach. It's supposed to be a very superficial thing. They're never supposed to get into factors of the offense. Has anybody heard of double jeopardy? Okay, so double jeopardy can apply to transfer hearings. There's a case called Breed versus Jones, whenever you guys leave if you want to look into that. But Breed versus Jones happened way back in California where they would actually dig into what actually happened when they were actually trying to prove the different factors of the offense. For me, premeditated manner is actually one of the factors you have to prove on homicide charges. So that's one of the things that you have to prove for a first degree charge. So there's certain evidence that's, that's being admitted. There's certain lines of questioning that come along with that. And what that did was that pretty much gave the DA this sneak peek at what the defense's strategy was going to be. And so that's why it's such a big issue about double jeopardy, because you never want to give the DA that upper hand. And he actually got that with me because he got a chance to examine me, uh, to cross-examine me, and really pull out everything he could to use in his case later on down the line. Number five is the possible rehabilitation of the child by use of procedures, services, and facilities currently available to the court in the state. Um, yeah. If anybody knows anything about DCS, there was nothing there. So they didn't have any facility that could really help me. If they said that I was really struggling, whatever they could prove in that aspect, there was no one here that could really help because it was and still is in shambles. So there's no really effective treatment here in the state of Tennessee for kids who are struggling like that. Hopefully that changes under Margie Quinn, but number six, gang offenses. So gang offenses, no matter where you go, it's always gonna be an enhancement factor. And so that's gonna weigh against you too in the transfer hearings. So at the end of the day, after weighing all these hearing, at weighing all these factors, the judge found at my transfer hearing that they weighed against me and she ruled for me to be transferred to be tried as an adult. After that, I had to go up to my room, pack my bags, um, trash bags, that's what they give you to pack your stuff pack all my trash bags with everything I owned and immediately be taken to the adult jail. And while I was packing, I'll never forget this, while I was packing all my stuff there, I heard my DA's voice on the television outside the pod talking about me. And what he said, he was feeling proud of himself. You could really tell he was proud of what he did that day. And he said, she's dangerous and the public needs to be protected a whole lot more than anything that could possibly be done for her. And I'll never forget those words that he said. So I went out, took my bags, and I was sent to, why does this keep changing? Sorry. Sent to the adult jail, which is where I'm at there. Because I was a juvenile, because I was just 16, I was housed in solitary confinement. It was automatic. It wasn't because of anything I did or because of a, a threat or anything. There were other people charged with homicide, but it was because I was a child, and by law, I had to be kept away from adults, you have to be separated by sight and by sound. And what that meant was that you were locked in a box in the adult jail. So for 23 hours a day, I was in this box and for one hour a day, they handcuffed and shackled me, as you see him doing here, to bring me out, take me to the shower, where they put me in the shower, locked me in the shower, took my handcuffs and shackles off, allowed me to shower, with come back out, handcuffs and shackles, could go outside in a dog kennel and walk around for a bit. Most days, the only sunlight I saw came from a 12 inch square in a concrete wall. And the only human contact or human conversation 
that I had from the guard who was bringing me my food tray. Um, so that was my life for two years. When I was finally allowed out of solitary confinement, allowed to live um, among other people there in the jail, it would take me months to learn how to have simple conversations with people, just to interact. I didn't, I didn't get the concept of having conversations because it had affected me that way. You have grown men who are prisoners of war, grown men who have serious offenses in prison who are placed in solitary confinement, and it's grueling on the psyche of anyone who's ever had to spend at least just one week under those conditions, but for kids who get transferred to be tried as an adult, it's automatic. And for most of us, it's many years that you have to spend under that circumstance. Um, things have changed in some places where they don't send you to solitary confinement, they can keep you there in the juvenile facilities, but for most places, you're gonna be sent to an adult jail and put in solitary confinement for a year or two. So during that time, that was when all of the hearings for motions, so that was when we filed a suppression motion. Um, during that time, there was also some adults there in the jail, what we call jail snitches, who came forward and said they had evidence against me. Um, so they turned state's evidence and said that I made certain statements, and so I had to change lawyers. So instead of being represented by the public defender's office like I was, I got private attorneys who were paid by the court as court-appointed attorneys to take over my case. And so on August 21st, I don't know why I put them out of place, but I'm sorry. On August 21st is when I finally went to trial. I was 18 years old when I went to trial because I had sat there all that time going through all the motions. The pre-trial motions phase is a really long time. You think when someone's arrested and you know, then they'll go to trial in a few months, but actually it takes a couple years more often than not. Um, so two years later, 18 years old, I had a five-day trial and I had to sit there and have this blank look on my face while a bunch of strangers just argued about whether or not I was a monster. Um, I couldn't show any kind of emotion or anything like that because that, which was on my first day of trial, the first time I showed emotion, the DA tried to use it against me. And so I just sat there stone-faced the entire time, throughout my entire trial, um, while they argued about whether or not I should be thrown away. When it went to deliberation, the jury took less than six hours before they came back, and they convicted me on all counts. So I was sent to Tennessee prison for women um, because a judge pronounced my sentence right on the spot to life in prison. It's an automatic life, life sentence for anyone in the state of Tennessee who's transferred, tried as an adult, and convicted of first degree murder. So automatic life sentence means 51 calendar years here in this state. That meant that I would be 67 years old before I was ever considered to be released. And I remember going back from the courtroom. I kept it together. I wasn't going to let anyone show, see any emotion or let them know that it bothered me. But when I got back to my cell, I threw myself on that bunk and I just wept. And I remember crying out to God and I said, God, if you let me out of here, I'll tell the world about you and what you did. And unfortunately, that was the last prayer that I prayed for a very long time. So years would go by and I would sit in the Tennessee prison for women filing appeal after appeal. That's me going to court on one of those appeals. And every single appeal that I filed would be denied. Um, and so I just felt so hopeless going through this, this time. But there was some hope while I was there, and that came in the form of Lipscomb. So Lipscomb University actually had a college program where they came into the, the prison. Students and teachers came to the prison to have class with us every Wednesday night. And we were getting actual credits, actual degrees, completely free because it was paid for by donors. And for someone who was sent out of school time and time again, considered not worthy enough to be in the classroom, not worthy enough for the time and the effort, it was really meaningful for me that there were strangers who were willing to invest in my education, invest in my potential. And so I ended up just thriving there in that. I went on to get a 4.0 GPA and earn two degrees, an associates and a bachelor's. Um, went on to be a mentor to other women in prison and even had opportunities to sit down with government officials 
to talk about ways to change the law and the system for other young girls in my situation. I ended up getting some new attorneys following a documentary that was made, not the Netflix documentary, um, not the Netflix documentary, um, but a PBS documentary aired back in 2009 and I ended up getting some attorneys who filed for a post-conviction appeal. Do y'all know about the different appeals? So when you go and you get convicted, you have a direct appeal if you actually went to trial. If you took a plea deal, you don't have a direct appeal. You only have your post-conviction appeal, which is also open to people who went to trial. At post-conviction, you're trying to prove that there's new evidence that was never heard at the first trial, or you're trying to post-convict your attorneys by saying you had ineffective assistance of counsel. And so that was what they were doing. So they put that together and I had another state conviction appeal, post-conviction under ineffective assistance of counsel and FASD. Um, I won't get into that. I think you guys, I think he said some of you guys had seen the documentary, but FASD is fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So basically they sat me in a courtroom and said I was retarded. Um, so there was that. And then we have my fa federal habeas corpus appeal. And under the federal habeas, which was the last attempt that I had an appeal, we challenged the constitutionality of life sentences here in Tennessee because there was a line of court cases that came out, which is Miller versus Alabama. You had Graham versus Florida. You had all these cases coming out saying that legally you could not give juveniles life sentences for non-homicide charges or an automatic life sentences without actually taking into consideration their youth. So the judges in the Supreme Court actually came out and said that their culpability is not on par with the adults because their brain is not developed. So your brain is not fully developed until you're about 25 years old. For guys, it takes a little longer. Um, so your brains are still developing, they're still being myelinated. And, and I, wasn't, I wasn't like, Throwing, throwing a slug or nothing like that. Like, it's like scientific, it takes guys a little longer. Sorry. <laughs> but, so it's, it's unconstitutional because the culpability isn't the same. So if you're not as culpable as this person, you shouldn't be sentenced to the same amount as this person. Does that make sense to you guys? If you knew what you were doing, you knew full well what you were doing, then you deserve a certain set of consequences. But if there were other factors going to play, then there's some mitigating factors there, then you shouldn't receive that same sentence. So that's basically the whole premise of this line of Supreme Court cases concerning juveniles getting life sentences. So the one for us was where they said that you couldn't get an automatic life sentence or life without parole. In Tennessee, what we have is a de facto life without parole. So what de facto life without parole means is that even though it says on paper it's a life sentence and you have an opportunity for release, in fact, how it actually operates is you really don't have a meaningful opportunity for release, which is one of the things that the justices said and they're holding in that line of cases. So in Tennessee, 51 years, that's not a meaningful opportunity. 67 years old, what am I gonna do? Am I gonna get out and go live on a park bench? Who's gonna be there to support me? How am I gonna support myself? I don't have any skills that I've been learning there in the prison. Um, they're not rehabilitated places, they're warehouses. So how is that meaningful? And so that's what we challenged in the federal habeas corpus. And your teacher actually told me that you guys had discussed the Tyshawn Booker case. And so Tyshawn Booker actually, his attorneys worked with my attorneys to pick up that appeal because we ended up not going through the full process with the federal habeas corpus because I was let out, praise God. Um, but that's the grounds that he's arguing is that Tennessee's life sentence is still a de facto life without parole sentence. So that's something that you guys can follow up on if you want to. So after that was denied, because it was denied for a time, I pretty much had no hope for an appeal. And the only hope I had was for clemency. And clemency is a long shot. So clemency has absolutely nothing to do with the courts. Um, there can be judicial clemency in some cases, like where there's probation or something like that for misdemeanors, things like that. But clemency is a power of the governor. He has a power of executive clemency. So he can pardon someone, meaning if you have a conviction that was from way back when and you want it scrubbed off your, your, your record, he can, he can pardon you. Um, he can pardon you, he can exonerate people on death row, 
So if they have a death sentence, he can exonerate them and resentence them to a life sentence, um, freeing them. It happened with Gail Owens, who was a friend of mine, who was a woman on death row. There was two women on death row, Krista Pike and Gail Owens. Um, Gail Owens did, did good things with her time. Krista Pike did not. So Gail Owens actually was able to demonstrate in her plea for clemency the positive things that she had done in that time. She had a lot of people who were going to bat for her, so she was exonerated. So she was taken off a of death row. Her sentence was commuted to life, which back in 1995 when she was sentenced before then, that was just 25 years. She got on parole, she got out, um, lived a good life for a few years, and then she passed, unfortunately. But in my case, I was going for a commutation, which is the third thing that the governor has the power to do. Exoneration, pardon, and commutation. I wanted my sentence reduced from 51 years to 15 years. And people thought I was absolutely nuts because it was very rare for anybody to get clemency because less than 1% of applications actually make it to the governor's desk. You guys know what a gatekeeper is? The parole board is the gatekeeper when it comes to clemency. So by law, only the governor can approve or deny clemency applications by law. They don't always play by that rule because what the parole board does is if they feel that you're not worthy of even having a hearing, the governor will never see your petition. It will just get thrown away, chucked away somewhere and never see it. If you don't have people on the outside who are really pushing to get your petition before him, you have no hope. And that was the story for a very long time. Um, so when I went up for clemency, just to put things in perspective, the only person other than Gail that had got clemency was someone who had got it 20 years previous. And her sentence was commuted to like five years before she was gonna get out anyway. It wasn't that big of a commutation. And I was asking to be commuted for like 40 something years. It was, it was big, but at this time, I had rediscovered my faith, thanks to my now husband. And I believe that God would do it for me. He did it for people in the Bible, why wouldn't he do it for me? And so I just had that faith and I just kept believing and that appeal that was denied and the federal court said that I couldn't appeal it, it was reopened all of a sudden. Then when I started preparing my clemency petition, the Lord was just telling me, you need to ask the victim's advocates group to write a letter. You need to ask the senator to write a letter. All these people were supporting me. I went on the news on Fox 17 and did an interview with Stacy Case and God made that thing go viral. So all of a sudden you had people all across the country who were praying, who were tweeting, who were making all this noise, so much so that the governor's phone system shut down because there were so many people calling to advocate for me to be released. I actually met the woman who pressed the button and was answering those phones um, in addition to meeting the governor and they had a specific option to press for me if you were calling to ask for me to be released. Um, so that just shows you the power of God, because everybody thought I was crazy and that it would never happen, but he just flipped all that, right? So during that time, even though it was really crazy, it was all over the place, everyone was talking about, you know, free Centoya, free Centoya. Behind the scenes, it was freaking everyone out, because political decisions here in Tennessee are not necessarily made by what's popular out in the world, especially not what T.I. or Snoop Dogg says. Nobody cares about that here. If Dolly Parton doesn't say it, it is not Bible. So we were nervous about how this was going to come across in the governor's office. And my attorney actually had a chance to meet with the governor's office and his attorneys. And, you know, he was, he was, he was kind of hesitant because in his position, he didn't want to be seen as showing me favoritism because it was so popular. And he thought about what about the other 200 juveniles who are st still in that situation. So he really struggled with that, um, that whole process. So there was this six month period from the time that I was actually given a hearing, um, which again, that was a miracle because less than 1% of that 1% actually get hearings, um, uh, actually get to the governor's office. But I had a hearing before the parole board when I was 30 years old, even though they said I'd be 67 when it happened had that hearing and for six months it was silence like there was nothing oh yeah file for clemency there but there was silence after that so we didn't hear a thing we didn't know what was going on and you had all these people who were speaking down on the situation 
quoting odds and worst case scenarios, telling me, well, maybe if he does grant you clemency, it's only going to be 30, 30 years. And so you'll have to do 15 more. And I just flat out rebuked them in the name of Jesus because God told me I was going to walk out of there. And I clung to that. Um, and so I just kept my faith. I just kept speaking faith to what seemed an impossible situation. And on January 7, 2019, I was called down and told that I was being commuted by Governor Haslam. And is that my last slide? That is my last slide. Um, so I was commuted by Governor Haslam. And so God had effectively turned my 51 years around to 15 years. And so I got out in August, about seven months later after going through the transition center there at the Tennessee Prison for Women. And ever since I've been going around speaking, um, telling my story to churches, to organizations, to universities, all across the world, honoring my promise to God way back when, when I said, if I get out, I'll tell the world what you did for me. Um, but also because he's really given me a heart for young people. I don't want any of you, any of your friends, to have to go through what I went through. When I was going through the transfer situation, I never knew that I could get life in prison as a 16-year-old. How many of you guys are 16? I got life in prison when I was your age. I never got a driver's license until I was like 30, 32, how old am I now? 34. So when I was 32, I finally got my driver's license. So I had never had a license, uh, never gone to a homecoming or a prom. I never got to do any of that because I was sent to prison for the rest of my life. Never thought that was possible, um, but it is. And so it's really important for me to let you guys know that. When I was going through the school system, I didn't feel supported. I didn't feel like my life mattered. I didn't feel like there were people who were out there going to bat for me, working to change the systems for me. But I want you to know that it does. I want you to know that every single one of you matters, not just to me and to other people who advocate on your behalf, but there's a God in heaven, an actual God, an actual living God, who is watching you, who does hear you. I spent a decade feeling that he didn't hear me, he didn't see me. I went around telling anybody who would listen that he didn't exist. But the whole time he was setting things up so that I could be in this situation, that I could be in this position where I had a platform to speak on this. I had a platform where I'm having dinner with governors and senators to talk about reforming the system. I would have never been able to do that if he would have freed me when I begged him at 16. And none of, none of what I'm capable of, none of what I'm doing now is because of, of who I am. It's all because of, of what he has enabled me to do and him working through me. So I don't know if anybody's gonna tell you that, probably not in this setting, but I'm here to tell you Jesus is real and he will work through you to do great things through you. And each of you has a destiny, each of you has amazing potential, things you can't even see. So I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what it is that you're struggling with because we all struggle with something, but I promise you, I promise you there's gonna be a turnaround for you. One day you're gonna be able to stand up flat-footed and talk about how God turned things around for you. I believe that with my whole being. I don't know who in here needs to hear that, but I promise you it's gonna get better. So now, if there's any, do I have time? I told you I would probably go over 45, okay. Um, if any of you have any questions, literally any questions, I know he said only smart questions, but I am one of those people that think that there are no dumb questions. So anything you wanna ask, like I'm down. I noticed uh, one of your charges was uh, criminal impersonation. Yeah. I know that's compared to everything else that was like, what, what was that because you lied about your age? So criminal impersonation is because when the police came, I lied about my age. Okay. So one of the things, when I talk about trafficking, what you need to know, it's, completely, it's complete manipulation, it's mental. So there's this picture that's been painted that you know, trafficking is when you're out walking and you know, in the suburbs and this white van comes up and scoots you and next thing you know you're being sold in a cabinet on Wayfair. No, that's, that's not really how that happens. And I'm gonna be honest with you, a, a lot of the trafficking victims are black and brown girls who are out there in the community and they're being exploited by these adult men, but you don't hear their stories because it's not popular because it, people really don't identify with that. Um, so there was a, there's this whole system of oppression that operates within trafficking um, and it kind of changes that narrative. But one of the things that happens is your trafficker, he'll groom you to understand, you know, your main priority is to make sure I'm taken care of, make sure this operation is, is stable, right? So one of the things that he did, I had a completely different identity. My name was Centoya Denise Mitchell, which is technically, technically not a lie, that was my birth name. Um, and I was born in 1985 instead of 1988. 
so that I could be considered old enough so he wouldn't be charged if ever we were in a situation, much like we were when I was butt naked in the room with him in a hotel. So that was where the criminal impersonation was. So I lied to the police, but the interesting thing is I never once lied to any of the men who picked me up because they simply did not care. Well, it depends how you, how you want to say go to bat, right? So, number one, I'm always going to give God the glory, and I'm not going to let anybody take that. And to me, Kim Kardashian, I don't even like to say her name, God forgive me, but she's no different than you or anyone else who was sending tweets out to support me, right? Who was having conversations, this happened around Thanksgiving, around about this time when it was going viral. So who was having conversations with their community at the water table, or with their family at Thanksgiving about it, who was praying with me. They're no different. And so, yeah, that's, that's all she did. She sent a tweet. A lot of people think she got me out. No, she did not. No, she didn't. God got me out, and I had my own lawyers. So she never got me any lawyers. That's absolutely false, unequivocally false. So. So the guy that was trafficking me, his name was Cut, um, short for Cutthroat, and he was actually killed eight months after I was arrested. And so that's just another example of how God will hide you, right? He will put you to the side because if not, I would have likely been right there with him and I could have been dead too, which I was, I was headed on a path where I was going to be dead soon anyway. She's got a hand right here. I keep looking at him. Red shirt. <laughs> Go ahead, baby. Oh, this is, man, I don't even know if I have time. Okay, so here's the thing with like trafficking. Here's my thing. Like, not just from my own experience, but from the girls that I work, through, work with who are going through it. We have a lot of organizations who get millions of dollars, millions of funding from the government, from donors, from all these people who work for, you know, awareness to increase awareness um, or who create, you know, these, you know, many exploitive systems where they give them jobs to create soaps and things like that to keep them trapped in that situation, you know, other than the one that they were in. But we don't really have anything that sets them up where sustainability is the thing. So even if you get them stabilized, which means let's get you out of this situation. Let's help you recover from whatever trauma you're going through. What about sustaining that? So how is, how is that going to be sustained? And one of the big things that goes into that is, you know, the economical situation, because that's, that's a big factor. When people go set up OnlyFans, why do you think they're doing it? Because they need to make some change. When they go to the strip clubs, why are they doing it? They need to make some change. Like, they have to survive, they have to eat. And if there's limited options, limited resources, you know, to provide for your family, for yourself, then sometimes you go back to what you know best. And so what if there was grants for these individuals to start businesses? I worked with um, Lipscomb University, which I still contract with them through my consulting agency, for um, a section of that school called Business as Mission. And one of the things we did was we started this business incubator, this business accelerator for people who were formerly incarcerated, people who have gone through trafficking, where we help them get business skills and connect them with funding to start businesses so they can start their own thing. Um, I'm actually starting one of my own, you know, to actually encourage and empower people, enable them to connect with the opportunities and resources so they can work for themselves. Jesus said, you know, you can give a man a fish and he can eat for that day. But if you teach him how to fish, he's going to eat forever. And for me, like, I want to teach people how to fish. I don't want to keep them trapped in my pond either, if that makes sense. So I feel like government needs to put more money towards solutions gearing towards sustainable recovery from trafficking. They need other options. Dylan? How it, was that what? Mm -hmm. 
So God has really blessed me in that I haven't had to have a job, if that makes sense. So I've been able to, number one, my husband, I had a husband who was successful and you know, if I didn't wanna do anything, I didn't have to, but I did. So the work that I do is all geared towards what God's given me a heart for, right? It's given me a heart for change. And thankfully I actually am compensated for that too. And so I've started my own businesses um, and so I've been successful in that, but that's why I'm so passionate about opportunity and resources for people coming out of incarceration, for people who come from impoverished backgrounds to have access to capital, access to the resources they need to start businesses. Because after you've been in prison for so long, whether that's a physical prison in the system or a prison under someone else's control, who wants to go to a nine to five where they can barely make ends meet? You know, I want everybody to win. I want everybody to eat, you know? Um, so that's, that's why I'm a big advocate of that. So it's, it's been really a blessing that, that I haven't had any struggles. There are other consequences um, of me being you know, in that situation, of me being on parole. So anytime I go out to do my job, which is speaking for these different groups, I have to go to the parole office in Williamson County out there on Century Boulevard. I have to take a drug test in front of a person, which means they have to sit there and watch me pee. Um, take a drug test to get a paper to sign that says that I am on parole for first degree murder and wherever I'm going I have to walk into the police station and have a police sign that which is terrifying in this day and age if you know anything um, I also have to carry an identifier an ID card that is a prison mugshot that in big bold letters in red at the top says violent offender and again, if you know anything about what's going on in this day and age, it's terrifying to have to do that. If I don't speed, I don't care how angry the person is behind me that I'm going the speed limit, I do not speed. Because if I get pulled over for speeding, I have to show that to any officer. So that's automatically going to change that situation if that officer doesn't have adequate training. Right? So it's really much a, a roll of the dice. So there are other consequences because of that. And you know, I'm very private about where I am. I'm just now starting to get comfortable, you know, actually going out to the community where I live because I don't know who's happy that I'm free and who's not. So, I mean, there, there are consequences behind it, for sure. Cool. But God's kept me. So, define parents. So my adoptive mom, who if any of you watched the documentary, I hate that the old one is out because I'm going to tell you I'm not here for Netflix. Like they really exploited the crap out of the whole situation. Um, but my adoptive mom, the one that raised me, like she's been there from the jump. Like she stayed down ten toes and she's still there. And so she's around. My dad is around. Now my biological family, they showed up when there was cameras. Um, but then they kind of just disappeared. And so I don't, I don't connect with them. And you know, that disappearing was, was it was pretty much my, my decision too, because I'm of an age where just because your family are related to me, if you're not healthy for me, you don't deserve to be in my life. And so I will cut people off in a heartbeat if you're not healthy, because number one, I have a mission, I have a calling, and I'm not gonna let anything get in the way of that. I know that people are watching me because of what you said, all that publicity. So there are people in government that's watching me. Governor Haslam has attached his name to me. I'm not putting myself in any situation or around any people who could jeopardize that because I know the work I'm doing is important to so many others. And so it doesn't matter who you are. So they got cut off for that reason. Okay. Go ahead. So I don't think the system was against me. I think the system is set up to be against everyone who was like me, if that makes sense. So I think the way the system is now, it's not set up to be for anyone. It's not rehabilitative, it's not restorative at all, the way it's designed. Just the whole back and forth to the adversarial nature from the beginning, when you think about people and law enforcement, all the, the conflict that goes, like that, that wasn't meant to be that way. 
it wasn't meant to be that way. They were supposed to be here for us. And so now it's always constantly back and forth, um, which I speak about that a lot because one of our best friends is actually a cop in Houston. And so it's really interesting to see like, you know, from both perspectives, like how that plays out. When you think about attorneys, how that plays out, like the DA, it's so adversarial, that system. There's no conversations, nobody's really communicating. Um, I actually got to meet, I kind of glossed over that, but my professor, for a judicial process in Limscombe, the very first teacher that I had actually turned out to be the prosecutor that was arguing against me during my appeal to stay in prison. Um, and we actually became really good friends after that. Um, so that was interesting. But the system itself, it's just a warehouse the prison is. You have to fight to get anything. Lipscomb had to fight to get in there to help give us classes. And so it's just, it's not set up for anyone to succeed while they're in there and on the front end it's really set up for a lot of people to be placed in its grasp more often than others and you know we talk a lot about the disproportionate black and brown people who are thrown into the system but the reason behind that is economics because i was locked up with a lot of people who were treated that way because they didn't have the funds so they were in rural Tennessee, or they didn't come from a family that, you know, lived over in, you know, Whispering Hills or wherever, whatever that street is with all those big houses. So, you know, they didn't, they didn't come up there. And so they couldn't afford to pay $25,000 for an attorney to take their murder case, which that's how much it costs average for a decent attorney is $25,000 for them to take your case, right? They couldn't afford that. Do you know how much money that is? How much people are actually making? Nobody really has 25,000 extra dollars. And so who does that put on the short end of that stick? People who can't afford that. So they can't afford good representation. You have a lot of good people in the public defender's office who have good hearts, but they're overworked. They have too many cases for them to really put the dedication needed into your case when you're facing serious charges. And so that puts them on the short end of that spectrum. So I think that there are several factors at play where the system is set up against every single person to come against it. Oh, Lord, y'all don't laugh. Oh, oh, what do y'all think I ate? Something good, right? Chick-fil-A was like the second thing. A can of ravioli. A can of Chef Boyardee ravioli. And my husband thought I had lost my mind when I told him, make sure you have me a can of ravioli, because that's all I've been thinking about when I've been sitting here in this cell, that that's what I want to eat. And so I had a can of ravioli, and that next morning, after I checked out my parole office and before we went and got uh, my nails done, we went, <laughs> uh, now I don't even bother. But those are the things that was important to me back then. We went and got Chick-fil-A, so I had some chicken minis, the second thing, so yeah. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure, too.